the fact that there's a woman's month and that doesn't make sense to me. Women are over 60% of the population of the world and they are given a month in one year. And it doesn't make sense. In uh, when the Intifada started, uh, which started actually by children throwing stones at Israeli tanks or soldiers, um, the Israelis decided that they will not allow these workers to go in any longer into Israel. It became very difficult. What actually happened was that the Israeli army would be running around Gaza, pursuing children with stones, who were throwing stones. And the men, the fathers, the heads of the family, in fear of losing their jobs in Israel, would hide. The only people who stood up against the Israelis, defending their own children from being arrested, were the women in Gaza. The Intifada was crushed by the Israelis eventually, but what happened to women was very interesting after that. These women, very proud, peasant women, who never ever wore a veil on their faces. They wore the traditional Palestinian dress. They had a very beautiful head cover, very similar to the images you see of the Madonna uh, in art. Um, I think because the men felt emasculated by the fact that the women were the defenders. And they lost their position as the breadwinners, the heads of the family. Their children lost their respect for the men, folk. The women became very strong. Things developed in such a way at the same time, there was a new resurgence of Islamic uh, ideologies in the region. And you found that these women who stood up to the Israeli soldiers became covered. The men wanted to exercise their right. Uh, that gave way. Suddenly you saw women wearing long dark coats covered, totally covered. Action Space was launched in the 1960s to provide creative activities for people with learning disabilities. Um, up until that point, people were really institutionalized and very much um, sort of confined to day centers. So the whole idea was to get them out of the day center and give them some creative, enjoyable, and challenging activities. Um, in 2004, we took the decision to concentrate on the visual arts. Um, it was an area of strength for us. Um, there were other organizations that were working in performance, in drama, in dance. We were the only people working in visual arts, and we felt that the visual arts was really important for people with learning disabilities, um, because a lot of them were either nonverbal or they had a lot of problems using language. And in a community where words and language are pretty much our currency, um, they, had, they were trapped, they had no way of communicating. Three of our um, ladies that work with us, um, who all have really thriving creative practices, um, none of them could discuss their work in the context of you know, contemporary art practice or reflect on postmodernism or anything that, that we do. Um, but all of their work is, is very vibrant, it's very relevant, it's all work that can and sometimes does sit in galleries alongside other work. It's all been appreciated, people buy their work. Um, but they can't communicate with us because they can't use words. Um, so to end with a question, if you had all of this inside you and you couldn't communicate it out, wouldn't you have challenging behavior? To talk a bit about power and powerlessness, I think, because I, I'm very, I was shown this picture and asked what were my reactions to it. And there's something about that sculpture that has that, that has that blossoming, burgeoning feel of, of youth and promise. And at the same time there's the extreme violence um, with the grenade and, and, and with the heart um, attached to it. I wanted to think about politics in that way, in, in, the, in, in the politics of 
being powerful, being, being powerful in politics, having power as that, and then feeling very powerlessness and feeling that the only way that you can be powerful is, is, is to sacrifice yourself, is to blow yourself out. And it was interesting, um, I was talking to my, my husband about this, and he, um, he immediately focused in on the grenade, and he said, she's got a grenade on her vagina. And, uh, <laughs> and so he immediately saw a kind of... A, a, it was interesting. He didn't necessarily see her first as a victim. And I was talking to my, my um, friends on the Labour Party stall this morning, which is um, what I spend my Saturday mornings doing, which is campaigning and standing on Labour Party stalls. And they said, yes, but someone put the grenade there. They didn't, someone else put the grenade there. That was a woman, of course. She saw someone else putting the grenade there. Not that you could take the grenade off and do something with it, but that someone else had put the grenade there. I think that I'm in politics because I think that I can change things, that I can make a difference, that I can um, make powerless people feel more powerful. In a sense, that's why I wanted to do it. I started off as a journalist, and I thought that as a journalist you could change the world, that by writing about stuff changed the world. But actually, I came to the conclusion that it wasn't about writing about stuff, or at least for me it wasn't. It was about actually doing... So we're going to present a combination of things and respond to... Layla's work with uh, our own practice and some of the thoughts that come into that. I wanted to start with showing you these three human figures from the proto-urban period, um, made around 5,000 years ago. They were discovered in a tomb next to two disarticulated skeletons on sort of during an archaeological dig um, near an early Bronze Age site in southern Jordan, and they're now on display in the British Museum. Um, I highly recommend going to see them. They're really lovely, um, quite small objects actually in real life. Um, and they're in the British Museum right now, so you just have to go through the Great Court and into ancient Egypt and then up the stairs. And they're there in room 59. And there you'll find them behind some glass, in a glass case, next to a text panel from which I harvested the information that I've just told you. Alongside this contextualising information, is a short description of the figures themselves, okay? It reads, these three figurines are made of unfired clay. Yeah, okay. Although very crude, um, two clearly represent males. <laughs> <laughs> the third might either be female or has lost a small piece of clay. <laughs> so, there we go. We can, we can go home now, safe in the knowledge that we've learned about the representation of women in the British Museum. I came to a point when I was developing this, this talk where I felt it would be appropriate for me to become... Um, uh, the lost piece of clay. I found it. And with this, I, I thought about doing this so that I could um, <laughs> embody and true and be the, be the thing that I wish to embody here, which is an, which is an artist, um, before, before being a female. Therefore, what I, um, what I want to use today to do is to declare um, that I, that obviously... I need to change my view of femininity and my view of what it means to be female. It means to have a female practice and means to be a female artist. If you'd have asked me two years ago if I was a feminist, I would have said no. Even though I believe in equal rights for men and women, I wouldn't have seen the necessity to label myself. However, over the last year, my attitudes have changed, and more recently, the depiction of women in the media, especially on TV, has become a big concern of mine. This is no means a new observation, but it has intrigued me to why now, in my late 20s, I've kind of felt this personal shift in my politics, specifically in regards to feminism, the depiction of women, and how this inevitably will have an effect on the generations below us. So in the past I haven't seen myself as an artist making feminist work, um, but in my studio practice at the moment, uh, these are things that keep coming back to the way that I'm working. Uh, at the moment, I'm interested in exploring audiences' archive and opening up discussions, um, and I'm going to invite everybody to partake in a short activity. 
stand, stand up if you have unrealistic expectations. <laughs> stand up if you want to get your opinion heard. <laughs> Sit down. Stand up if you have ever been stereotyped. <laughs> Sit down. Stand up if you hold doors open for other people. Good. <laughs> Sit down. Stand up if you don't see a glass ceiling. <laughs> Sit down. Stand up if you like it when people hold doors open for you. Sit down. Stand up if you've ever felt hostility from the feminist movement. <laughs> Sit down. Stand up if you ever feel the need to use your assets to get something done. <laughs> Sit down. Stand up if you've ever considered yourself oppressed. <laughs> Sit down. Stand up if you see yourself as feminine. <laughs> Sit down. Stand up if you know someone who's had plastic surgery. Okay. Stay standing if you know someone who's had a boob job. Sit down. Stand up if you get really annoyed when people speak over you. Sit down. Stand up if you've ever felt intimidated walking home alone. Sit down. Stand up if you've ever been embarrassed because of your gender. Sit down. And stand up if you call yourself a feminist. Sit down. Stand up if you don't like being told what to do. <laughs> <laughs> Sit down. Two years ago, an artist, a female artist, commissions me to make sound for her film. She gets signed to a gallery, and the gallerist, also female, attends the opening screening of the film. On the train home, I'm horrified to find myself sitting opposite the gallerist. I mentioned that, she, that it's great that she assigned the artist while she was pregnant. She informs me that I'm right to be su surprised, that not many would do the same, and that just five years ago, any artist who got pregnant was seen as retired. The pregnancy was some sort of sign that you'd given up or had decided not to be a professional artist anymore, or it was just too risky to support. Visiting Tate Modern, you'll find a room called Double Life. The work on display features work by a feminist artist, Linda, Sanya Ivekovic, and the Gorilla Girls posters. Outside this room, it's as if the messages in those posters have not been heard. The majority of the artwork on display in Tate is by men. It's up to me to pay attention to those overlooked voices and to acknowledge their value. And by doing this, I can gather the confidence in my own viewpoint, show it slowly but surely enough to stand behind it, to not apologise or play it down, to recognise and articulate the gap in the conversation, Stay claim to that gap and fill it up. Girls can't go out walking in the streets um, without a gang or a um, male person coming up to them and, you know, disrespecting them. And it's mostly to do with gangs, like, their boys want to show off or whatever it is. In front of their friends. I think it's a lack of education that they feel like females should be called how they want to be like for example names like bitch, ho, slag for doing certain things or dressing a certain way or just walking down the road trying to go shop to buy your mum milk you get called hey what is it? Whistle because you can whistle. It happened to me actually yesterday because yesterday I was sitting outside another youth centre and I was just sitting there and some boy came up to me asking me if I want to come to his house and we have some fun and watch some videos and do the things what we get up to, what boys and girls get up to and I was like, no, I have a man, I have a boyfriend, I'm not going to somebody else's house and he was still going on and I said, look, my boyfriend is your friend, just stop it. Women and men are, are equal in this society, there's a lot of people who don't treat us as well as they should. I don't think anything should be classed as girl or boy. They should, we should be together and we should like be able to um, be friends with who we want. Everybody should fight for it that women and men have the same, same level. That everybody's like, 
same thing with job center same thing in social life same thing when you go shopping it should be everywhere equal and if you can fight for it fight for it i feel that a woman should have her own and a man should have his own there was a time when i just started college in september and we were doing our work and i passed my teacher some really good work of course and he looked at it and then he looked at me and he said oh distinction grade you're really more clever than you look so i sat down I, at first i laughed about it and then i sat down and it actually started to process in my mind and i thought wait he said i actually look cleverer than i look so do i really look stupid so it made it seem like because i'm maybe a female or a black female or maybe the way i was dressed or the way my hair was done was the fact that i wasn't well educated if it's national women's month why isn't anyone celebrating i'm so happy that we've got the right to vote and women can go to school and everything like that and we're allowed to have jobs but one thing that we need to tackle is the sexism the sexism yeah when a woman thinks they get unfair treated, so a man gets better treated than a woman, just say it. Say what you think about it. I don't think I'll change a thing, actually. I think I'm a strong woman. A young woman. What would I change? Wearing weave. I won't change that if the mom was going to disappear tomorrow. Okay, maybe um, she would change the perception of many other people. You would change other people's perspectives, wouldn't you? I really think we should all close the gender gap, make equality for women, and who cares if you're lesbian or gay, it's cool. I mean, if people want to criticise you, let the haters hate. You are who you are, you can't fight that. And it's just, you know, we are human at the end of the day, so, you know. Um, as a female actor working in the industry today, I think it is very easy to give in to those feelings of being disposable. And it's sometimes crazy to think that as an artist in my particular field, um, whether I get a job or not can be broken down into whether I am the right age, whether I am the right race or the right gender. But I think what's led me to finding some way of making my acting active is, is by doing things like this and by choosing the material that I choose. And I knew that I had to activate myself in some way and not just be another body in, in the slipstream. Um, my drama teacher as a kid used to always call me Zowie the activist. And I was sort of never really sure why as I'd never really considered myself as political necessarily. I probably was, a, 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 it's worth saying, about 11 at the time, so <laughs> a, an activist at that point, I was like, yes, I am active, I'm 11. <laughs> Most of my friends are. That's great, I'll take that on, that's fine. Um, I've worked really hard so far at navigating my career as an actor so that most of the time I would only be involved in projects that would move other female actors um, Specifically, I think female actors of non-white ethnicity forward. Um, and I'm reminded of being on the set of my first ever feature film, the British classic, St. Trinian's 2. Um, it really is one of the hundred films you should see. I'm joking. Um, and it's a film that was so much more commercial than I ever thought I would get a chance to be in. I, um, so I was really excited. I became less excited when um, the... Part of the title of my role was um, a, a chav. The, the, the title was Leader of the Chavs. Um, and it was a word that I was pretty much determined I wouldn't be associated with straight from the audition. I insisted that I have a meeting with the producers to have the word chav removed from the title of the character. How old did I think I was? But that felt really, really um, Im important. And it was a real benchmark for me in terms of proving to myself that I really was becoming the type of artist who would speak out for what I believed in um, and against the, rep the unbelievably repetitive nature of this business to sell images and a language of so social stigmatisation. Um, and so my recent work um, called Dreams of a Life feels like it was a real gift in terms of being able to 
just gather all of the facets of my personal politics uh, which I've been putting into practice in the acting profession. Um, this film had a female director and producer, both who worked tirelessly for four to five years to get the film financed because no production company was willing to take a risk on a story with a complex and subtle female lead character, female lead black character. So this leads me on to the work that I'm doing at the moment. Um, I've been involved with a company called Clean Break for the past three years um, as their writer in residence. Um, and they are a theatre company that use theatre education as a means to rehabilitate women who are ex-offenders um, at risk of offending because of drugs, mental health issues or domestic violence. Um, it's also an amazing company because they manage to constantly also dodge the rain of bullets that seems to be the, the press and its attitude to uh, creative work um, involving women and, and, and women's issues. I feel like a very... Uh, exciting time to bring all of the things that everyone's talking about today to some kind of um, forum where they'll hopefully be treated with respect that they deserve. It says evergreen with vim the antagonist scheme, in public brazen rain and spleen, emotions wrong this feudal scene, bigots with a sheepish sheen, the more I preen, they play obscene, and my zine is cast regime, apostates prefer my green, no more shall I self demean, no more talk of disesteem, my existence paid me on a gene, no guilt shall no more intervene, gender innate, I swim upstream, leave myself a lie, I scream, bewildered, never have I been, the label to the extreme, in amongst the crowd I beam, no more shall I self demean, no more talk of disesteem. The truth is that we go unseen, straight on a continuum scene. In with my people, I convene to live life fully, I keen. Not to oneself from life, I glean. From the savage, I we refine the art of dream. No more shall I self demean. No more talk of disesteem. Alive, this newfound self esteem. Hormones and courage split my screen. My breasts and door, my inner queen. Full of cheeks and necessity. Hips and buttons along the lean. Muscle was complete of pain. Woman no more shit myself to me, no more talk, but this is the evergreen. Give the man a round of applause because I mean, really, 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 and um, when I saw that, I kept thinking about struggle. I kept thinking about feminism. I kept thinking about the things that women have fought for throughout the ages. <clears throat> and, um, and I said, you know what? It's not really my area of expertise. I don't like to call myself a feminist. Um, and it, it, there have been a couple of occasions where people have said, you know, where did you study and all this kind of thing. And I thought that I'd tell you, if I can be called a feminist, and I, I, I really don't know. It doesn't matter to me, really. To me, it's about the experience. So I bought this photograph here to, to just show you what my mother was like when she um, came to this country. And this was the girls, actually. Which is quite amazing. And... I didn't see this till a couple of days ago. I've got a passport. And uh, you can't see it from there. It's an amazing... The blurb on the front is amazing. It's like the ambassador wrote it personally. The photograph... You see the security on the photograph now? This is just a, a photograph that they take from a booth and just blue tacked it in. Um, but, you know, I want to talk about her because obviously she means a lot to me, but her struggle was the struggle that kind of inspired me, even though along the way, you know, I went really wrong, and I'll tell you about that in a moment. I've only got 15 minutes, so <clears throat> I'm going to try and keep it. I probably won't do it, but I'm going to try and keep it to the 15 minutes as much as possible. Um, my mother was walking down the road with her sister in Jamaica one day, 
and she saw a poster on the street saying, come to Britain where the streets are paved with gold, there is work, this is the mother country, etc. I'm, I'm sure you've seen your posters or heard of them. My mother was with her sister and she said to her sister, do you fancy going? Oh, she didn't say that, she said, you are make a trip. And uh, my auntie went, no way. Do you know how cold that place is? No way am I leaving this country and going there. My mother <clears throat> went to her uncle and told her uncle that she'd seen this poster and that she wouldn't mind going. And my uncle, uh, her uncle, I think, said, um, OK, I will give you the money. She told me how much it was the other day, and it was something ridiculous, like £30 or something. You know, right? And um, so she got the money, she paid, and uh, she came over in 1957. So this, you can see it later, because like I said, it's really small. This is her, like, in 1957. I think this is her a couple of years afterwards. Um, <clears throat> she came over and she did all the stereotypical things that black people did when they got here. They thought there's loads of work because there were so many factories. When they saw chimneys, they thought chimneys were factories. <laughs> so every house was a factory. <clears throat> um, she looked up at the sun and went, the sun bright, but it's still cool. <laughs> <laughs> How did they do that? <laughs> and um, <clears throat> she uh, made her way to Sheffield first. And what she really wanted to do was nursing. She, um, for the first couple of weeks, she worked as a cleaner. And then somebody um, in Sheffield said, why don't you go to Birmingham? I think I can fix you up with a job in nursing if you get the training, of course. And um, that's what she did. She went to Birmingham. We uh, lived in a place called Aston. That's where I was born. Anybody here from Aston? No, but I know it. No, but I know it. Who said that? I don't know what to say to that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> do you know Aston Villa? Yeah. Alright, I won't say anything then. <laughs> um, I actually lived in the house where if you went through my back garden and climbed over the fence, you went into the garden of Ozzy Osbourne. <laughs> yeah. I remember them when we were kids, they were a really naughty family. <laughs> but, um, <clears throat> My mother, I've got to tell you, she was a, what they used to call back then a state registered nurse. She did a course in nursing. She got on to become a state registered nurse. And um, she had this thing, you know, moving to Britain was like moving up the social ladder for her. So not only did she move to Britain, but there we were living in Aston, Handwerk. And you've got to excuse me, I'm really dry. I've been taking lots of drugs today and I'm slightly lightheaded. And um, if I sit down, that's why I've got the chair here. You know, it's, it's sitting down, I think, is better than collapsing. So <laughs> bear with me. Um, <clears throat> she had this thing all the time about moving up the social ladder. So although we lived in Aston, Handsworth, she had contacts in the National Health Service. So she arranged for me to be born in a place called Coles Hill, Marston Green, which is like uptown Birmingham, posh Birmingham. You know. It's a place where, certainly back then, Black people just didn't go. Um, I revisited it a few times, but um, maybe I shouldn't. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you that one revisit I did. Some of you may know that, um, that I got into a bit of police when I was younger, right? And I guess I can be open here and talk about it. Yeah. Well, um, I used to love going to Marston Green to steal cars. <laughs> um, because they just had such nice cars. <laughs> <laughs> One day, me and a couple of friends stole a white rolled rice. Could you imagine? It's like three rasters in a white rolled rice. <laughs> and this is like 1974 or something like that. Right? And, um, <clears throat> and it was so cool. It actually had a record player in it. Some of you won't even remember what a record player is. It had a record player in it. And, and uh, I don't understand young people now, because they get a car they like, they burn it out. You know, they, they run it to the ground and then they literally set it to light afterwards. And we would never do that. If we, if we did the car that we liked, we would 
drive it nice and cool, and then put it back, you know what I mean? <laughs> we may want to revisit it. <laughs> so, uh, I remember on this occasion, we put this, uh, put this car back, and um, we took a few goodies out of it to make some money, and we were selling them in a second-hand shop the next day. And they were just like bits and pieces. And we sold them, but the guy wouldn't take the records off us. We had some bank over and stuff to sell. And um, we were followed at the shop by a man who said, I'm interested in buying these records off you. So we said, yeah, that's cool. He said, how much do you want for that one? You know, and I said, well, give me 10 shillings. Nobody here remembers shillings, do you? <laughs> Whatever. And uh, we, we did a bargain, and then he just turned around and said, um, I'm a police officer. And my heart sank. And he turned around to me and said, what's your name, young man? I said, Bob Marley. <laughs> <laughs> he goes to my friend and says, what's your name? He says, oh, oh. what's your name? Bonnie Wheeler. My name is Bonnie Wheeler. <laughs> and the couple, you know, before like, mass computerisation, he's actually taking his notes. Bob Marley. <laughs> <laughs> um, got a conditional discharge. <laughs> Kind of worth it. But um, <clears throat> yeah, that was the kind of place Marston Green was. I was a twin. I got a twin sister. Um, my mother at the time was actually a maternity nurse. My mother claimed, I don't know how true this is, but she says, I wouldn't tell a lie, I swear I'm holy Bible. <laughs> so she claimed that she delivered Lenny Henry in um, Jodie Road Hospital. Um, it's interesting, she can remember. His birthday, but she can't remember mine. <laughs> now I am quite unusual in that I don't, I really don't know my birthday. It's either the 15th of March or the 15th of April. Um, we've always said the 15th of March, but one day the passport people sent me my passport back and well, the documents we made and said, This is wrong, you were born in April. And we said, No, I was born in March, April, March, April, March. So they said, right, let's go back to the papers and see the papers. Some of them, you know, some of these papers are countersigned, right? By witnesses, etc. Some of them say March. Some of them say April. <laughs> so I mean, you know, I mean, I say I'm like a queen. I've got, like, my official birthday, which is the 15th of April, and my personal birthday, which is the 15th of March. <laughs> I remember when, um, after the government were bugging me and saying, you know, you've got to tell us, you know, bring us evidence of the day you were born. I went to my mother, I said, Mum, come on. Now, I was a very difficult birth. Although I was a twin, I was born in the corridor on the way to the theatre. And I said, Mum, come on, you, know, you must know when I was born. And she said, hey, boy, you know how difficult it was giving birth to you? <laughs> huh? Huh? You think I was looking at the calendar? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I forgive her, you know. <clears throat> um, but uh, <clears throat> we went from there for some strange reason my mother thought it was moving up the social ladder to arrange for me to go to a school a primary school um, I think it was actually infant school infant and primary school um, that it was all white so me and my twin sister were the only black kids in the school and it was a very, very difficult time. Um, the teachers were kind of openly racist in a general way. I mean, I don't think any of them came out and said, we hate black people. But on our arrival at school, this is the way the kids celebrated our arrival at that school, by bringing in or painting their favorite golly work. You know, that's, and we were supposed to feel really good about that. You know? um, <clears throat> And then there were other things, you know, I remember um, <clears throat> standing in front of a teacher, and it was standing in, sorry, sitting in assembly, and they used to do this thing where the teacher would say, you know, good morning school, and the school would answer back, good morning Mrs Evans, good morning everyone. <laughs> and one day Mrs Evans said, um, we have a good news for you, we're going to have a cricket team. And it gets better, we have a captain for our cricket team. Little coloured Benjamin here, is going to be our captain. <laughs> and I'm sitting there and I'm doing what you're doing. And, I'm going, oh, and I go to the teacher afterwards and I said, Look, I don't really like cricket. I, I 
find it like really slow, uh -huh. and, you know, and it, and it reminds me of colonialism. <laughs> <laughs> and um, she said I was a born cricketer. Anyway, they, they forced me to play cricket. A born cricketer. They forced me to play cricket. And on the first ball, I actually broke my finger. So, one of my favourite writers of all times is C.L.R. James. You know, he wrote a lot of political um, essays and books. But for some reason, he wrote one book, and people say it's the definitive book on cricket. And I've read it, and I still don't get it. <laughs> when I think of cricket, I think of some form of child abuse, personally. But that's personal experience, and I said this is about personal experience. Um, <clears throat> my mother moved us out of um, me and my sister, which you realised he wasn't having a good time there. And I wanted to say something, you know, that if you listen to a playground, especially a primary school playground, it really is a place of joy, you know, you can hear it from in the distance, you can hear kids enjoying themselves, whatever it is they're doing, they are having a great time. And I think if you are in a playground and you are on your own, and nobody wants to talk to you, it's the loneliest place in the world. It really is the loneliest place in the world. And I remember being in that lonely place when Cassius Clay, Muhammad Ali, you know, he's going around the world and beating people up legally. And um, he won a fight, and I went to school the next day, and all these kids came up to me. They said, come on, Cassius, come on, and they beat me up. You know, thinking that I could fight like Muhammad Ali because I was black. The truth of the matter is I can actually fight like Muhammad Ali. <laughs> but not like ten against one, you know, it doesn't work out. My mother moved me from there <clears throat> to another school, which was great. Very mixed, very creative. I was always doing poetry, I loved poetry. I didn't call it poetry at the time, I called it playing with words. And in assembly, sometimes, the teacher would um, say, Little Benjamin, can you, you want to come up and do your stuff? And I would come up and I would do my thing. And, you know, and uh, they used to have a thing called Kiss Chase. You know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I said, yeah. <laughs> you again. <laughs> You're still doing this, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. um, well, I love sport, but I was a bit lazy sometimes. I didn't play Kiss Chase. I'd go up to a girl and I'd say to her, what's your name? And I'd just make up a poem. You know? <laughs> So you say, you know, my name is uh, Lana. I said, yes, it's Lana. I meet me on the counter. I love it really hard. Don't you? <laughs> <laughs> you go, I want you. <laughs> um, but I really opened up as a poet. And, um, <clears throat> but something happened at that time uh, as I was really enjoying that. So can I be really rude and ask for some more water? Um, oh, there's loads. Thank you. Um, I realised something was going on with my mother and father. Sometimes they would sit together and not talk. Um, sometimes they would send us to bed early for one reason or another. And then one night, I, um, for some reason, I woke up and it was like three o'clock in the morning. And I came downstairs and there was a frying pan on the floor and my mother was crying. And I said to my mother, what's the matter? Why are you upset? You know, as a kid, you think you cry because you didn't get your sweets or something, you know. And so I, 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 I'd never seen my mother cry. So I said, you know, what's the matter, mum? Do you want me to get something for you? Did I say something wrong? And she said, your father just hit me with the frying pan. And I remember looking at my dad and he just went, you know, get to bed, boy. And so there's, there's um, you know, they say sometimes with art, with music, with objects sometimes, they can trigger things in your imagination. This doesn't happen very often, but if I see a frying pan on the floor, obviously they don't end up on the floor very often, but every now and again, you know, I see people camping or whatever, if I see a frying pan on the floor, it takes me right back to that time I, I can remember that night so well. It's like one of the first strong memories that I had. Because I remember just trying to work it out. Why would Dad hit Mom with a frying pan? Why would he hit her at all? Um, many years after, I wrote a play for Radio 4 called um, Listen to Your Parents. I don't know if anybody heard it. It was a few years ago. 
It's about a boy who's in Birmingham having to listen to his parents while his father beating his mum night after night. And he's talking to you, the radio listener, trying to block it out. <coughs> and at the time, the BBC kept, you know, when you do the publicity, they kept saying to me, is this your life story? Do you want to tell them it's your life story? Because it would be, you know... And, and actually, it wasn't my life story. It didn't happen to me like that. But that bit about listening to my parents um, was true. And trying to block it out. And there's a little moment in that play. And it, word for word is, is what happened to me. I went to a boy called Robert. And um, I remember him well because he was an Irish Catholic. And when I was getting my racism, he said that me and you should stick together. Because, you know, they pick on me too. And I went, no, pick on you because you're, you're white. He went, but I'm Catholic, huh? So, you're Christian, you're white. And at the time I didn't get it, but we became friends. But I remember going to him and saying, Robert, man, what do you do when your dad hits, hits your mum? And he went, my dad doesn't hit my mum. <laughs> and I said to him, this is word for word as it is in the play. I said, oh, like you got one of them back to front houses, you're like your mum's a freedom fighter. So what do you do when your mum hits your dad? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and he said, my mum does not hit my dad. You know, there's no fighting in our house. And then it dawned on me that, I mean, it did before, but then I realised that probably there's something about when you're a kid, you think that it's happening everywhere, so, you know, you can kind of accept it, because if this happened, if everybody has, lives in violent houses, well, that's just the way it is. If everybody's rich, that's the way it is. If everybody's poor, that's the way it is. Uh, but when I realised that it doesn't have to be that way, um, I started to... Um, question a lot of things. Um, I'm trying to cut a very long story short. <clears throat> the beatings just continued and continued. There are nine of us in our family. I'm a twin. I've got a twin sister. There are another set of twins, two boys. And then there's the rest of them. Anytime my father, he, he, he started actually doing it in the open now, having confidence, beating, beating my mother in the open. Anytime he would start, my other brothers and sisters would run away, but I would run and fight my father. And my mother left home. We lived in like rented rooms. You know, you rent a room, you get a paraffin heater, and you know, one bed sometimes, and we just sleep on it sometimes. I may get a single bed up. Um, but it was really, really very basic living. I reminded my mum of this the other day because she, um, sorry, it seems like I'm going off here on, on a different subject, but bear with me. Because, um, you, know, you know, it's all about experience, but I really reminded my mother of this. She rang me in the middle of the night and she says, Benjamin. And she's whispering, you know, it's like two o'clock in the morning, she's whispering, she goes, Benjamin, they're coming. I go, who's coming? And I thought she had burglars or something. She says, they're coming, they're coming to get us. Who's coming to get your mom? The Muslims. <laughs> the Muslims are coming. I said, Mom, what have you been doing? She said, I've been listening to Radio 5 Live. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, the Muslims are coming. <laughs> and there's evidence of this. She's got a Muslim neighbour on one side, and a couple of days beforehand, the Muslim neighbour moved on the other side. So, and she's listening to 5 Live late in the night, and she really believes. And I said, Mother, think about it. When you were down and out, when you were being beaten by father, it was a Muslim woman that took you in and looked after at one point, took her in and looked after her. Um, it kind of upset me in a way because it was, you know, she just is beginning to believe all this stuff because she just, she reads the sun, she loves the sun. You know? um, she, she tried to convince me the other day that the sun is not racist because sometimes there are black people in it. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm telling you all this because, you know, it doesn't end up that my mum turns out to be a feminist or anything. You know, I've, I've, I've alluded to the way she turns out. But the struggle that we had to, um, the struggle against our father that we had to wage was amazing. Mother would take me shopping. My job is to hold my mother's hand as my mother was looking at the apples or whatever and look like this for father. 
I had a picture of my father in here. It's like a wanted poster. And I would look for him. And on a couple of occasions, we had to run. On one occasion, the first time I ever went into a police station, it was because I stabbed my father. My mother was walking down the street. My father, I've got to tell you, my father worked for the GPO, General Post Office, it was called then. And because he worked for the GPO, he could connect with people in the National Health Service, in, in, the, in the Dole Office and things like that. And any time my mum tried to claim, claim child benefits, like, my father would know. You know, that's how free that information moved between the men of these institutions. So my mother had to, had to either starve or, you know, just try and sign on for a couple of days and then move on. So anyway, we were walking down the road, my father jumps on my mother. He's got my mother down, he's beating her. I had a little pen knife in my pocket. I don't know if anybody here... I sound really old because I keep going on about the old times, but you used to be able to buy these pen knives for sixpence. Little pretty things they were, they'd have little patterns on them. And I got on top of my father, and I remember watching a program on television that said that if you cut somebody here or hit them hard enough, they'd die. And I'm trying to stab my father there. This pen knife is useless, it's folding, <laughs> it's folding back on me <laughs> and cutting me, like rip my hand apart. But the police come and they arrested me, and um, in the end, of course, they, they let me go, they had to let me go, and they knew what, what had happened. Um, my mother reminded me the other day of another incident where she was walking down the road, me and her were walking down the road, and her father came up behind us, this was in, in Edgbaston in Birmingham, and he grabbed my mother and started to beat her, and my mother said, look, it's okay, I'm coming home, you know, just to kind of make peace with him. It's all right, darling, I, I really do love you, yeah, he said, come home, come home, yeah, I'm coming home, I'm coming home. And she kind of put her arm around him and um, began to walk with him. And I remember thinking, this is odd, because usually we should run, you know, and my mum's being really nice to him. And she's saying silly things to him, like, so how are you nowadays, you know, how's your car? <laughs> and as she's walking with him, she turns into this, I thought it was a shop doorway, <coughs> this building, and it was the police station. <laughs> and the police jumped out and grabbed my father. And I almost forgot that. My mum reminded me of it the other day to see how, show you how, um, how smart she was. But um, they were very, very uh, difficult times. I could tell you lots of stories about lots of beatings and it would just get heavier and heavier. Um, but I, I realise my time is limited. But what I want to say is probably even worse than just what happened before in one sense. See, when I started dating girls, I had one girlfriend in particular that I had for a long time, and I started beating her. You know? I'm going to tell you how bad it is, or how bad it was. You know, so I don't start crying again. But you know, one day, she was a, an American Indian, had really beautiful long hair, and one day, I slammed her hair in the car door and dragged her down the road. That's the kind of person I was. And um, I remember when I used to hit my girlfriends, I used to do it in a way that my dad would do it. He had this way of doing it when he would talk. And it sounds a crazy thing to say, almost poetically with a rhythm kind of thing. He would say, all right, I tell you not to do this. Bang, but you go and do that. Bang, I tell you, da 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 bang, and da 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 bang, da 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 bang. And I started to do it. You know, somebody who should know better. But the problem was, there was other men around me, and young men around me, doing the same thing. As a young man, I actually, I just said I had a girlfriend. As a young man, I didn't say I had a girlfriend. I would say I'm controlling a woman. My brethren would come up to me and say, yeah, are you control that woman? That was the language we used. <clears throat> and um, at the same time, you know, I'm starting to write this poetry. I'm starting to do things on sound systems, posting and seeing whatever you want to call it. And giving to make a little bit of a name for myself, because a lot of the toasters in Birmingham were toasting about Jamaica, which is all cool. But I started toasting about Handsworth and what was going on in Birmingham. And um, 
one day in the 70s, you got a power cut sometimes. There was a power cut. And everybody was going to leave the Blues Dance. And I said, no, no, stay. And I just did my MC in just as poetry with talk in between it. And uh, as I said, started to make a, a bit of a name for myself. And then the National Front came on the scene. You remember the National Front? The kind of forerunners of the BNP. I think they're still around. But um, Skin and Fogs used to come and take dances and beat you up or follow you home and beat you up. And, um, and I remember once being on a demonstration, you know, and I think it was against racism and for freeing South Africa and stuff like this. And I remember there chanting, you know, free South Africa, free South Africa. And getting really kind of passionate about the cause that we were talking about. And literally, I just stopped in the road and went, what am I talking about? I just left a home. I just left a girlfriend in the house. And I told her not to leave the house. Because if she leaves the house and I come back, I'm going to beat her. And I'm not giving her freedom. Well, here I am on st in this demonstration. Everybody's going, how cool you are, Benjamin, saying free South Africa. And I just, I, in, in one go, I just saw my own hypocrisy. Um, so, I was kind of nervous about coming here because I don't know theories about feminism or anything like that. Uh, I haven't read a lot of the great feminist writers, I've read you know, some of them. I'm friends with some of them, fortunately, I've managed to meet some great people in my time. But you know, I, everything that I am comes from experience. And I always find that wherever I am, when I go into prisons or anywhere, go to now I talk to men who beat women. And something happened because I'm not somebody that studied domestic violence. I'm not, gonna, I'm not putting that down. I don't even like the word domestic violence, actually. But um, because there's someone standing in front of them that actually witnessed his mother being beaten and then went on to beat other women. A lot of people who are beating women find that experience, um, find that when I talk to them, well, they will listen because it's not coming from an academic. They don't say, you know, what did the figures say about this? So what was, you know, they say, what did you feel at the time? What was going through your head? And a friend of mine, well, this, this same girl who I dragged down the road once, and I, I really don't know how to deal with this. And as a man, I'm not sure if I'm qualified to even try and answer the question, but it runs around in my head. The same girl whose hair I caught in the door, uh, not caught, locked in the door and dragged down the road in the car. I saw her not so long ago. Um, and uh, took her for dinner. And she knew me when I'm, of course, when I was just young, when I was talking about doing my poetry and what I wanted to do, and just doing a bit of MC. And so I took her for dinner. And, and I said to her, you know, that stuff I used to do to you, I'm really, really sorry. I, you know, I, I don't know how to apologise for, you know, what I've done. And she turned around to me and she said, I liked you better then. You were much more of a man then. You're a whip now. You've been hanging out with too many white people and talking to too many feminists. <laughs> Seriously, that's what she said to me. And I just didn't know how to deal with it, you know. I just... <laughs> um, you know, I just started to talk about non-violence and nobody should hit anybody and even hitting children is bad, so hitting the woman is... And she was saying, but, you know, sometimes women need to be put in their place. You know? And, you know, when a man who's gone through what I've gone through is sitting in front of a woman <laughs> saying that to him, it's, it, it's... Fortunately, I'm strong enough to know that she's wrong. <laughs> even if she's a woman, <laughs> she, she's wrong. So, um... Um... Mm. Excuse me, I really am drying up. It's interesting, I think this is the first time it's happened to me. I'm so dry here, and I'm so wet here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say something before I go, because I'm going to finish now. This is my um, mother. This is her passport. It's only got one stamp in it. From Jamaica to England. I did actually take her back to Jamaica. I tell you, I've never, sorry, am I going too long? I did actually take her back to Jamaica. My mother, as I said, was raised by 
her grandmother and her uncle. She didn't know her mother that well. Now I'm going backward and forward to Jamaica all the time. <clears throat> so I decided to give my mother a treat. I said, right mum, I'm going to fly you. She hates planes, but she never flew on a plane, she came by boat. So I'm going to fly you first class to Jamaica, you're going to meet your family and all that stuff. I took her to Jamaica and um, <clears throat> I was touring in the States at the time and I came to an, <clears throat> a deal with the promoter. <clears throat> Sorry. I came to a deal with the promoter that said I would commute from Jamaica. So I took her to Jamaica and I had to introduce my mother to her mother. And, it, and they were so formal, they just stood there and said, how do you do? Because <laughs> my mother didn't really know her mother. She knew her uncle better and um, even her grandmother, he wasn't alive. <clears throat> I went to um, Texas or somewhere, I did some gigs, I came back to Jamaica. My mother was supposed to stay for about six months, she's standing there at the airport with her arms folded. Take me out of this god for sake place. <laughs> she hated it. She said, the sun too hot. <laughs> the buses don't run on time. <laughs> and the mosquitoes have no respect. <laughs> and I had to reason with her and convince her, because I thought it would be the last time. And I was right before my grandmother died. I said, Mom, just stay, just bear it out. And fortunately, she, she did. Anyway, um, so yeah, there's my mom, and here's my mom. And I love my mother, and my mother loves me. We come so far from over the sea. We heard that the streets were paved with gold, sometimes it's hot, sometimes it's cold. I love my mother, and my mother loves me. We try to live in harmony. Well, you can call her Valerie, but to me, she is my mommy. She shouts at me that it's all loud sometimes, but she's always been a friend of mine. She's always doing the best she can. She works so hard on inner England. She's always singing some kind of song. She has big muscles, and she's very, very strong. She likes pussycats, and she loves catching up, and she don't bother with no if and buts. I love my mother, my mother loves me. We come so far from over the sea. We heard that the streets were paved with gold. Sometimes it's hot, most times it's cold. <laughs> I love her. And whatever we do, this is our love, I know it's true. My 